good afternoon everybody i'm gonna get started with the kind of welcomes and housekeeping i can see we've got more people uh coming into the session but uh, i'll get started so we can uh, get onto the discussion and uh start and importantly also finish on time so it's great to have you all joining us today and we at the cipd are also happy to be back with our new series of webinars after a summer break and i hope that everybody that's tuning in or watching this on demand also managed to get a bit of rest over the summer, although I'm sure that like for all of us, it seems like it was a really long time ago now. Um, my name is Katie Jacobs from the CIPD, and I'm really pleased to welcome you to this webinar series that we hope will help you as people professionals in continuing to tackle racism in the workplace. So I expect that some of you watched our previous series, Racism and the Challenge for HR, and if you didn't, I would strongly encourage you to go back and take a look at that because it was really, really fantastic and we had absolutely brilliant feedback uh, and you'll find that on the CIPD website. This follow-up series aims to help you keep anti-racism on the business agenda. In this opening session, we're going to be exploring how HR can go about obtaining long-term leadership commitment to anti-racism work. How do we move beyond tokenistic or short-term gestures and embed genuine cultural change. Joining me to discuss this topic, I'm thrilled that we have a really, really fantastic panel of experts. We're joined by Sharon Amesu, a leadership and inclusion strategist who also holds a number of non-executive directorships. We've got Peter Cheese, CEO of the CIPD, Lorraine Martins, who's Director of Diversity and Inclusion at Network Rail, and Jeffrey Williams, an inclusion and diversity expert and founder of Jeffrey O. Williams Limited. Thank you all for joining us today. As ever, I'm just gonna run through some really, really quick housekeeping. This session's being recorded. You will be able to access it afterwards. Uh, to submit questions, and please do, because uh, these work really well when we have lots of, lots of questions and engagement. Could I ask you to use the Q&A tab? You should be able to see that at the bottom of your screen. So use the Q&A tab to submit questions to the panel, but please do use the chat function to connect with and speak to each other. The last sessions we did on this topic, we had some really, really active chat and participation going on in that function. Um, it was really, really brilliant to see, and I know the participants got a lot out of it. So please do introduce yourselves to each other and share opinions, experiences on there, even if they're not direct questions. Uh, the CIPD has developed a new hub on our website dedicated to tackling racism in the workplace and we are adding resources to that all the time so do check that out and finally I want to flag our well-being helpline for members in the UK and Ireland with award-winning workplace well-being provider Health Assured we are now providing CIPD members with free help and support via sessions with qualified therapists online or over the phone we know the last few months have been really, really challenging and emotional for many people professionals. So please do use the helpline if you need it. So that's enough housekeeping. I'm gonna move us on to the topic. The Black Lives Matter movement has challenged and reminded us how deep rooted racism is within society and by extension in our workplaces too. I don't know who saw that there was a recent survey by Business in the Community which found that a third of black employees feel their ethnicity will be a barrier to their next career move, which shows just how far we still have to go in achieving race equality in the workplace. The people profession has a fundamental role to play in building anti-racist workplaces, changing cultures, behaviors, policies, and practices. But true culture change needs to come from the top. So how can people professionals get anti-racism onto the board and leadership agenda and crucially how do we keep it there that's what we're going to be discussing today so please do as i said earlier get those questions in i'm going to kick off by asking each of our panelists to introduce themselves in a little bit more detail and give a brief opening statement on the topic at hand so can i come to you first sharon because you are the first person that i can see in my screen uh, hello and uh, good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here to be speaking to the members and attendees of this event. Uh, my name is Sharon Amesu and I am the co-founder of um, SA Consulting. Um, I was 
formerly a barrister for 16 years and throughout my professional career have been incredibly passionate about justice and equality. Um, up until recently, I was chair of the Greater Manchester branch of the Institute of Directors, which of course has a focus of working with directors. And it was very much a part of the conversation that I sought to drive within the organization of the prioritization of this agenda at board level and beyond. And so I'm delighted to be involved in this conversation today and contributing alongside these other incredible panelists. Thank you, Sharon. Uh, Jeffrey. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Jeffrey Williams. Um, as Katie said, I am the founder of Jeffrey O. Williams Limited, a consultancy that is supporting organizations to think about how they approach diversity and inclusion in their culture, in their communications, in their strategy. I'm also the co-founder of Rocking Your Teens, a social enterprise that works with young people to get them to think about their career journeys, but also to look at their mental well-being and how they approach the mapping of their uh, next steps in life. I think for me, this you know, conversation is truly important because I think a lot of the time as you build out a strong and, and relevant DNI strategy, you need to think about all the people that work within your organization. And at times, because a lot of this work is done in silos, this conversation is something that's overlooked. So I think getting this on the board, getting your leadership to understand how they shape this conversation and how they personally own it is an imperative and something that we need to really build on and, and lead forward. So again, like Sharon, I'm really excited to be here to share my thoughts and opinion and obviously engage with everybody. Thank you, Jeffrey. Uh, Lorraine. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for uh, inviting me to join you on the panel. Um, I um, am the Director of Diversity and Inclusion at Network Rail. I've been there for coming up to eight years, and before that, I uh, headed up Diversity, Inclusion and Employment and Skills in the construction of the Olympic Park. Um, this is an incredibly important time, uh, and, and it's a moment in time that we're going to look back on and, and, and kind of wonder how we got here, but also I hope be able to say we've made a significant impact because never before have we had a kind of global interest on race in, in the volume and with the proximity that we have had. So for me, this, is, this, this conversation is incredibly important and it is, I think, hopefully to help us keep the momentum going because I wouldn't want the gains that we are making just to be a moment, but for, to, for us to really sustain the changes that we want to see. Thank you. And finally, Peter. Yeah, thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Real pleasure to be with you. Peter Cheese, Chief Executive of the CIBD. Uh, these subjects and themes have long for me been a really, really important subject. I've talked in many platforms and forums over many years on the subjects of diversity and inclusion. And of course, uh, as all the panelists have already commented, I think now above all times is a time when we really, really have to make a difference. There's absolutely no doubt that a lot of the debate about particularly ethnicity and ethnic inclusion triggered by the events, uh, the very sad events and the death of George Floyd have called us all out to say, now we must take action. It's no longer just about talking, it's about action. And I feel that very strongly. I feel it strongly for us as an organization. I feel it strongly for us as a profession, the HR profession. We have such an important role to play in all of this. And I also feel it as, as a CEO, as a leader myself, and, and that I have to be able to stand up and share you know, what I believe with other CEOs and leaders. And indeed, I absolutely believe that I can't preach what we don't practice. So what we do within the CIPD, what we do to support the membership and the community, as we've already touched on a little bit, and what we do to help raise the subject of race and ethnicity in the workplace everywhere and keep it front and center I see as a very profound responsibility. So it's a great opportunity again to share the platform with some fabulous speakers and talk about this with all of you. Thank you so much. And uh, I'll echo what I said at the beginning, which was so thrilled to have such a um, experienced panel talking about this today. Um, so the first thing I wanted to, to ask is, and I, I said in my introduction that change does tend to come from the top. Is that something that you agree with as a panel? Do you think that it, this is very much a leadership agenda um, and if so what advice do you have at get to HR professionals in getting it onto that agenda if it isn't there already? Um, Jeffrey I can see you're slightly nodding so I'm going to come to you first. <laughs> so I, I do think it's a leadership agenda. I also think it's an everyone agenda within 
your organizations so a lot of time you know this work is led by those on the ground within hr and also those employees that are truly passionate about this work they they engage and 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 take actions i think for the leadership is getting them to understand how their voice needs to be a part of the conversation how they define their position and also the things that they may need to do to educate themselves around DNI around anti-racism around the point of the employees that they have in their organization and I think over the last few months and weeks what I've seen is that where organizations haven't had leadership with the capabilities to discuss this subject authentically there's been a lot of backlash and a lot of uh, I guess issues for the black employees working within those organizations and for the firms that were able to discuss this and, and for their leaders to say I don't know what I don't know but I'm willing to learn and I'm willing to educate myself and I'm willing to walk into spaces and be the only person that looks like me there but I'm willing to listen there's been a shift and I think for uh, anyone that's doing this work is that piece of kind of understanding how you personally connect to this conversation what is the things that you need to learn and where are you going to make changes that are going to actually impact your organization from a culture standpoint from a people standpoint but in the long term you know from your brand and reputation standpoint as well thank you um sharon do you want to build on that perhaps in some of your experiences working with executives and non-execs yes certainly i think her with Jeffrey that actually it has to be ground up as well as top down, upstream as well as downstream. Uh, in relation specifically to leaders though, uh, leaders are standard bearers. Leaders are the ones who set the tone. They are the culture shapers, aren't they? They are the ones who signal the way. Leaders are the ones who set the pace. Leaders are the ones who set the vision. And so what you often have and what I've certainly seen is where you have from the ground up laudably, uh, there is this will for change. There is an appetite for change. There is a, a participative edge as far as ground up is concerned. Where you have um, senior managers and below looking up at your uh, leadership board level team, senior leadership team and seeing apathy and disinterest, um, if not anti the agenda, then what happens is that passion wanes and people become frustrated, people become annoyed, disappointed, um, disenfranchised and sometimes people will just leave. So the need for leaders to be driving this agenda is of primacy right now. Leaders need to have a leading voice into this. They, they are required to, um, to really help people to see how important it is within their organizations. Now, the reason why I feel that um, it's so important for us to keep the conversation going, Katie, is there, there is a sense somewhat, I feel, that um, all because there is we now have lingua franca haven't we lots of people have been talking about um uh, equality we've been we've been having webinars upon webinars upon webinars uh, don't we all know don't we all know that this is important or actually that's not necessarily the case and just today i was speaking with a colleague who was explaining that he for a significant period of time has been head of diversity and inclusion in his organization and still hasn't secured buy-in from the board because they don't understand why it's important like sort of your baseline conversations are still taking place uh, so this this push this acknowledgement this persuasion needs to continue on and leaders are paramount to the success of this this agenda thank you i'm just going to read a comment that came in the, the chat which i think is a really nice way of putting it, which is that somebody saying they think change comes from the top in a healthy way. If it comes from the bottom, it means that something is, is really wrong. Um, Lorraine, can I ask you as a director within, a, within an organization, have you noticed an increasing appetite from the, if not the executive committee, then also up into the board in taking this topic seriously? And what advice can you offer on keep, A, getting it onto the agenda and B, keeping it there? Um, there has been an absolute, um, um, I think, increased commitment so i think network rail has always been committed to diversity and inclusion we have a five-year strategy we set out some work that we want to do around race so i think we were fairly well positioned in a sense to respond appropriately to the death of 
um, George Floyd. And we hadn't anticipated anticipate doing it remotely. I think that that has been the, I think that's been a good thing in a sense because it's enabled us to reach far more people than we would have if we were working in our traditional ways. In terms of both the executive team and the board, we've had some really very frank, very searching and very pro progressive conversations about our organisation, about not being where we want to be, despite setting out our commitments and our visions and having very clear um, targets for what we want to achieve. So I think what, what it has done has really reinvigorated that commitment and made us a bit more explicit um, and a lot more um, energetic, I think, about wanting to be successful in the changes that we want to see in our organisation. And I think that we have done that because we had done some of the homework, which was to align the work to that of the business. So it's not a, a, a standalone insofar as um, it's that thing that's done over the side. It's actually understanding the benefits from being an anti-racist organization, from having um, a diverse workforce and from those uh, employees um, being their best and having an environment that can en enable them to support the delivery of your, your performance. And I think that's some of the work that we need to do more of which is align it to the day-to-day -day business. This is about the people. And if our people are being discriminated against, uh, not allowed to be themselves, they're not gonna perform, we're not gonna deliver the, the business. And once we understand that, then this isn't about keeping anti-racism on the agenda. This is about how do we make sure our people are, are equipped and able to do what they, they can do. And as leaders, are we making sure that environment is, is absolutely spot on to make sure that that happens? Thank you. And then Peter, how does this resonate with you both, I guess, mm. as a, with your CIPD head of profession hat on, but perhaps more pertinently with your kind of CEO hat on? Yeah, in, in, in lots of ways. I think if we're really honest, and as you highlighted, Sharon, many business leaders have really struggled with this. I mean, I've had a lot of reactions like, so I know this is important, but what am I, what am I, what am I supposed to do? Or, or other reactions like, well, I thought we got this largely under control, so now what is it? And when we use words like racism, anti-racism within the workplace, business leaders saying, hold on a second, does that mean I have a racist organization? What are you saying? And so, so it has, if we're really honest, been a very, very challenging conversation for many, many CEOs. But I think as, as we've already touched on, the context of this is so important. And, and Jeffrey made a very important point. I have long talked about diversity and inclusion in all its forms as being a business agenda. It is about organizations that, res, that reflect the customers that they serve that reflect the societies and communities of which they're part of, and therefore is absolutely fundamental to the ideas of a responsible business. Um, it is also, of course, about attracting all and retaining all the talent you need. So a lot of good business context things here, which we need to reinforce in part to help keep this on the, the agenda as well. But also, as Jeffrey Riley said, this has become a reputational thing now, and nobody can stand by and, and not reflect on this and not say, what are we doing that's different? And I would say that's true for the CIPD as well. As, as, as Katie said, and as I said, you know, I, I see my responsibilities as the CIO here very, very importantly. And that whilst I thought that we were doing a pretty good job, we have a very good diverse uh, board, for example, we have pretty good diversity and we report those stats in the organization. But as we've dug deeper, we recognize of course there are things for us to address and to fix and that we need to improve. So I think it, it does, as we've all acknowledged, it has to start with that tone from the top, that recognition and that commitment from the top that we're going to do something that helps to change your organizations for the better, that is open and honest about the issues, that reflects our own personal understanding. Because I, like so many white business leaders, I remember a, a session I was doing on diversity four or five years ago. And I said, part of the problem for, uh, for, for us as leaders is our ability to talk about race openly at work. Uh, and this black guy who was responsible for DNI, I think, in, in, well, in a large organization, said, and he immediately interrupted and pointed at me and said, No, you do because you're white. This, for me, is my lived experience. And I'm sure we'll touch on this idea much more. But the idea of us all understanding and respecting things like lived experience is a very, very important part of this dialogue as well. And therefore, racism in all its forms, all these microaggressions, all these in quotes misunderstandings, they're all part of the debate as well. And it is vital that as business leaders, we understand these things at that kind of level 
so we can create the safe environments that allow people bottom up to engage in the conversation as well and to help to make long-term sustainable change, which we all know now is so, so important. So Peter mentioned um, that some, some leaders that he's engaged with have been getting perhaps slightly defensive. And I think mm -hmm. the context is so crucial now, especially because a lot of leaders have been dealing with keeping their organizations afloat during a global pandemic. Um, so how do you deal, any advice, um, Sharon, Lorraine or Jeffrey, on dealing with that kind of, that kind of pushback? So whether it is a kind of defensiveness or a kind of point blank refusal to engage or somebody who just, as Peter kind of put, just doesn't see that it's a problem for their organization. Um, Sharon, can I come to you with that first? So I, I feel if I can just use my own personal experience and the approach that I've taken to these conversations that I've been having. And one of the things that I feel is really important in brokering these conversations and building these relationships is saying for, as my opening gambit, what I genuinely believe is that this is not about approaching this with an accusatory tone. This isn't about pointing the finger and saying wrong, 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 wrong. But actually it's about recognizing the status quo, where we are right now, what the gap is and what we need together to do to bridge that gap. And I often reference the fact that when I think about the apartheid movement, I grew up during the 1970s and 80s and I remember very clearly the apartheid movement and the ultimate liberation of Nelson Mandela. And as a child growing up, I'd watch the um, various news items and I'd see involved in those marches, many white people alongside black people. I was amazed by it. I continue to be. Um, even now, I'm in the process of um, founding an organization that's going to be supporting black female leaders and accelerating their, uh, their professional careers. I have already amassed a, a wealth of, of a fleet of white leaders who want to come alongside and support and champion. And so I feel what's really important in this is, is the way in which people of, um, who are ethnic minorities approach this conversation. I feel that's really important um, that we see this as bridge building and recognize that um, we, we can create enemies in the way in which we approach. And that's not about watering down, it's not about dilution, it's not about compromise of the core message, but it's about recognizing that there are people who don't look like us, who want to help and want to come alongside. So how do we build effective allyship? It's the heart in which we come to it, as those who are wanting to champion the cause on the, on the side of those of ethnic minorities, but also on the side of those who are your, your white leaders in, who are heading up organizations and so on, coming with a learning and listening heart and encouraging that together as a partnership. Thank you. Um, and Lorraine, same question to you, but I'm just going to throw in somebody's asked uh, specifically to you in the Q&A, um, that having worked a number of years in your role, would you be able to share any of the roadblocks that you've encountered that might have prevented your organisation from making as much progress on DNI as you've intended? So any information you can share or stories about overcoming any resistance? Okay, so um... I wanted to, to build on what Sharon was saying, really, which is, is, is kind of seizing the moment. We, we have, a, as I said in, in my own introduction, an opportunity to enable people to have some conversations which will, will not necessarily be comfortable, but which are very, very important. And I think um, for leaders, it's, it's, it's opening up that vulnerability about what you don't know, what your discomfort is and acknowledging that you know that that things need to be better and without that then it makes the it makes the conversation much more difficult and progress um, will be inhibited so i think leaders have to open themselves up to the conversation in network rail we've uh, got a program of reverse mentoring for all of our exec executive leadership team um, we're also introducing diversity and inclusion objectives and they've got a suite from which they can choose, but it enables them to identify something, a specific activity that they can undertake, which reinforces their commitment. Um, 
we're asking different parts of the organization to include diversity and inclusion in, as part of their scorecard. So again, it's about how you integrate it into the, to the fabric of the business. In, in terms of the, 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 the blockages, um, that they are perennial and ethereal. <laughs> so at times you can think you're making really great progress and then something happens in an organization of the complexity of, 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 of network rail, which spans uh, the UK has got something like 42,000 employees. There will always, always be something that pops up that you, work, you, put, you put your hand in your head. Is this, oh, this has been recorded, so I can't even do Chatham House rules. This is great. Um, <laughs> you know, you put your hand in your head and you say, well, how, you know, how, how did that happen? And I guess it's, it's to be ready for that. It's to, to be ready for those things that you think you've, you've weeded out of your organization that will pop up and remind you of the serious challenge to create a, a more diverse and inclusive organization. So there are people who will be resistant, um, who will be passive in their resistance, so they will know that the environment is not rife for them to articulate it in, in any particular vocal way, but their behaviors will, will definitely signify a, a resistance. And I think you, you have to, one that makes that environment increasingly uncomfortable and people will make decisions about whether or not that environment is the right place for them to be. And I think you do that by um, creating an environment that is truly inclusive, that is challenging in the most positive way, but also creating, uh, I guess, a momentum for people and a direction for people to know that this is where we're going and we're resilient and committed and, and, and we're going to get there. Um, and I think you also have to engage with people to try and understand what the resistance is about. Is it about that fear, i.e. that you're going to bring lots of them in and take my job? A palpable fear. Um, is it that, oh, I have to actually change and do something different? You know, is that some of the fear? Um, but being able to have that discussion, I think, is as important um, as the kind of changes itself. Um, because some people do feel that they lose out as a consequence of, of, of having a more diverse conversation. You can only watch the, the conversations around the changes in Sky Television and BBC Television to hear what people are saying about there's just too much of this stuff going on. And so the resilience that you need for all of those blockages, which may be passive aggressive, they may be um, unconscious, they may be direct, it's your resilience to withstand those and to make sure that you've got the right infrastructure that can help you make the incremental steps that are necessary um, over time that I think are really important. Thank you. Um, I've got some good questions coming through on the, on the Q&A, so I'm going to bring a few of those in as well as um, chucking some of mine in as well. Um, this question here, I'm working with forming a DNI group focused on supporting organisations, groups and individuals within sport, law and the media, um, I'm picking up huge concern about how to capitalise on this moment we're having in a way that elicits focused and immediate action that produces quick results. The frustration about progress and resistance to the idea that culture change always has to take a long time. So what are our views on what can be achieved at pace? Because we all know that culture can be a bit of an oil tanker to shift. So Peter, any advice on getting things done quickly? Yeah, I saw the question. It's a really important one. And I think a lot of people have expressed that, you know, concern that we've been talking about this for a very long time and a real demand and expectation for action and visible change in the short term. And I think there are so many things that we can do that aren't just about long term, longer term cultural shifts. I mean, opening up the dialogue within our organizations, being honest about where we are, asking our people from all different backgrounds, particularly ethnic minorities, but what is their lived experience in our organization? looking at our recruitment practices and policies, opening up networks and forums where not just those communities are talking within their communities, which is important in terms of support, but talking with everybody else. And, and we've done a lot of those things within the CIPD, which I think has shown people, first and foremost, that we are serious, even though, as I said, I didn't think we we're all that bad a place, that we know we've got to improve. And showing people that we are doing that, we're taking action, we're trying to understand more, those are all things that can be done right now. And it was encouraging to hear, from, I think, from all the panel members saying, look, 
for the most part, we are seeing this as a here and now moment at our board levels. And we've all talked about the importance of leadership remaining committed to that. But leaders will want our help as well and say, okay, I get it, but what am I supposed to do? And as I said, I think there are a lot of these sorts of things now, the dialogue, the conversations, the networks, reviews of our practices and policies, serving our people, understanding how they feel about their own lived experience will give us a lot of very actionable insights that can help to move the dial. And, and therefore, I think whatever sector we're in, that we can start to show real progress. Thank you. Um, and Sharon, what do you think about that? Does culture change always need to take a long time? Are there any quick wins? So I, I, I don't think there's much more that I can add to what Peter has said, that there, there is low hanging fruit that we can immediately uh, tap into. Uh, I feel that what we also need is the setting of ambitious goals. Because what tends to happen is there's an acquiescence. There is, do you know, this is a big thing. It's going to take time. And therefore we just then lean into our seats in the expectation that it's going to be the next generation that's going to have to change this. Whereas I feel those who actually become ambitious and they refuse to accept things as they are, they become passionate about change and driving change. And I look at, for example, young Greta Thornburg, and she said, she's telling the world, look, we're on fire, and therefore we need to take action now. And she's bringing the primacy of the agenda up front and center. And as a result, she's mobilized young people, young people who would have otherwise children who'd have been sat in front of a whiteboard in their classroom learning about, um, Tom and Jane, I'm giving my age. But in fact, what she did is she managed to just galvanize them and give them, engendering them a sense of urgency. And so I feel if we keep having this conversation, helping businesses to understand that actually it, it's it, this thing, yes, it is gargantuan, yes, it is big, but there are steps that every single one has agency in, in order to move the dial forward, Every single one can do something each day. Each day I can think about myself being an inclusive leader. Am I engaging people in conversations? Am I listening? Am I learning? Am I developing myself? Those are quick wins that every single person each day can do from today. Also in relation to metrics, I feel again that there, this acquiescence of it's going to take 108 years or it's going to take 202 years in order for us to receive um, equality and parity on the economic front, et cetera, et cetera. Actually, I feel that if we start to contextualize in our organizations and say, well, what do we want to look like by when? And rather than just having yielding to this overall context and saying, well, it's all of us and this is the challenge for everyone. What about in my organization today, what ambition is, as Lorraine was saying, we've got five year goals, we've set them out, and this is the, these are the steps we are going to take to move toward them. And I feel that's how we'll start seeing a tsunami of movement toward change. Thank you. And on the metrics point, just um, to ask you, Lorraine, somebody's asked in the, in the chat, can you give any information, a, a bit more information about um, the targets and metrics that you tie to your leaders' objectives and um, what those look like? So we haven't tied the objectives particularly to our leaders, although our chief exec and the group HR director have taken on two broad elements of gender diversity and race. Um, equality as, as specific objectives for them to do. So the targets that we have are uh, by the end of 2024, we want to have 26% of our um, business to be female and we want 13% to be um, black, Asian, minority, ethnic uh, background and similarly for our leadership cohorts to reflect that. Um, we want to double the um, uh, amount of people who are sharing their disability and sharing their sexual orientation. We want all of that to be increased so that we better understand the composition of our workforce. So we've set those, we've set those out. In terms of the specific objectives, they range from things like um, undertaking um, uh, being part of being a diversity and inclusion champion, which has an induction and requires you to do certain activities, um, driving what we have a process called diversity impact assessment. So making sure they're done in your function, which is working out the effects of what you do on different people and different communities, 
um, leading diversity and inclusion sessions, being a reverse mentor. So things that are tangible that people can do, we've set them out quite explicitly for people to choose. And, and, and therefore, by delivering that, you'll be contributing to the success of our strategy. Does that make sense? That makes sense. I can see somebody saying, uh, it's great to see all those kind of targets and objectives linked to the anti-racism agenda. Um, Jeffrey, welcome back. I feel Jeffrey's back in an office for the first time. So I feel, were you just told to move rooms? I was. <laughs> <laughs> that, that would never happen if we were doing this in person. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, Jeffrey, a specific um, question that's um, directed at you. At times, organisations will expect that the HR or the quality or DNI lead will resolve all issues of quality without leadership actively making action plans to resolve these issues. How do you propose that this is challenged? So actually, funnily enough, I have always kind of said to everybody that I've worked with that I'm only one individual or my team and I are, you know, 10 individuals working on this work. We're not going to change the world and that they do need to lean into this. So it's a lot of conversations around getting them to understand how they have ownership of the conversation. So whether that's in, you know, you're going to go to market to hire certain individuals, how are you going to make sure that you're hiring those that are diverse, that don't look like you, that didn't go to the same university as you, and giving them those moments to really kind of understand how they need to lean in it from an emotional intelligence standpoint, but also from an action standpoint. So going back to, Lorraine, to what Lorraine was speaking about, when I worked at Thomson Reuters and I was their global head, we looked at how we were going to get our leaders to actually own the processes and the decisions that they were making and making sure that in doing that work, they were then going to make changes. So there was targets that we'd set. So we were looking at being 40% uh, uh, women in leadership by the end of 2020. So they're still on track for doing that. But then also looking at how we could diversify and represent the societies that we worked within. And I think, you know, the, the main point is really getting them to understand that they own this and that it's not just a DNI team that now is responsible for diversity and inclusion that's not going to change anything. Diversity is a part of your culture. It's a part of your identity. And they own that um, and, and are the barometer of what that culture means and making sure that they actually can understand and articulate that for themselves. So, yeah. Thank you. And building on that and weaving in another question, mm -hmm. um, I'll, I'll come to Peter with this. Um, so in our organization, the focus has started with exec and board, which is vital, but for longevity and impact, how do we ensure it reaches middle management? So as Jeffrey's saying, kind of weaving it into making it part of everybody's job. So given that middle managers are often the ones that are interacting, supporting and developing individuals the most, Peter, what advice do you have on making sure that once you have got it onto the top agenda, it uh, filters down effectively? Yeah, I mean, the first thing I'd say is that um, I think good organizations roll down objectives through the organization. You know, just have one set of objectives to lead us in something different for everybody else. And, and as everybody's commented on the panel, the diversity and inclusion is everybody's issue you know, from the top, absolutely. But certainly through our management layers, as, as, as the questions touched on. And, and I think several, a couple of thoughts, not only roll down the objectives, but of course, we've got to do more to train and educate our managers. I mean, the, the reality of what we've talk about in terms of psychological safety and I can see a number of questions and points coming up about us. I feel safe to express my concerns. I feel safe to say to my boss and my boss's boss that what you just said there is inappropriate and, yet, and we need to understand that. Questions like that and, and we have to train and support our managers in that just as much as giving them measurable objectives. And then, you know, I think within all of that, it's, it's also these metrics, which is a really, really important question. And uh, yeah, we've done a lot of ethnic pay gap reporting and so forth and how we understand that. But, but the first thing I think is that we're all using this time, I hope and believe, to really understand the nature of our organizations and the demographics of our organizations. And, and you know, again, if I use the CIPD example, what we found and probably should have understood better before was that we have a not untypical shape for many organizations now. You might find more focus has happened on, say, gender and ethnic diversity at the top of organizations. So you can say, Actually, boards are beginning to show some of that progress, maybe even executive teams. And then the lower ranks of organizations, you know, partly through demography and other things, we might have actually done a better job of, of attracting more diverse people into the lower level of the organization. But the progression becomes a real challenge. Finding those role models at senior to top levels is a real challenge because we have not done enough to sustain and support people 
from different backgrounds facing perhaps different challenges in our organizations to be successful. And we've got to understand all those different dimensions. And then we're, we're looking at therefore ideas of saying, well, okay, as a team member, as a team lead, do I understand the demographics of my team? What have I got to do to support others? How do I create, as I said, a safe culture? How do I build in things like mentoring, which we've all got a responsibility to do. Mentors aren't just things that sit at tops of organizations. And those are the things that I think we can embed and to make sure this really is rolling right down to the organization and building this idea, which we've all touched on, which is this has got to be something everybody understands to, in order to build truly diverse and supportive culture. Thanks, Peter. I'd like to build on that point um, and weave in a, an, another question that's come in that's about um, progression and career development. And I'll, I'll put this to you, Lorraine, but I'm just going to read out the, the point. Um, so somebody's said that their organisation recently revealed their equality gap data. There were no BAME um, people at senior level, but more concerningly, there were a high number who were intending development and leadership programs internally, but were not progressing. How can we assure that organizations are developing BAME leadership internally and supporting those that come into the organization and are welcomed by an organization that might be a bit hostile to change? Any advice on career progression specifically? I, I think it's really important that, that any organization uses that data as the basis of their conversation. So you start to interrogate it. What is happening in terms of tracking those those people who've been on the on the um, development programs, what opportunities have they um, been presented with? Have we thought of giving them further um, secondment opportunities to build this, their skills? Are they getting feedback? So I think you utilize that data as, as, the, as the basis of a, a further exploration as to what's happening. And are there behaviors that still happen, that they're still facing um, which are meaning that they're not going to, even though we've invested in their, their um, progression, we're not actually creating any opportunities for them to progress. And so I think that's, that's a really good site for some in, in, in interrogation and exploration and, and challenging yourself. So why haven't, why haven't we appointed them? Why haven't we given those people those opportunities and face into those, those conversations? Because a lot of a lot of the time it, it, it's about um i describe it as a bit of a fear so even though you've invested in people you still you still want to go to your go-to people who don't look like them and so you, you you've made a a kind of semblance of, of of change but you're not really actually giving people an opportunity and a chance and i think if you face into that then things can change you can unlock some of the behaviors that mean people encounter those barriers thank you great Great advice there. I um, had a couple of questions about um, what to do if you're working in a medium or a small organization where nobody kind of has that responsibility for equality or diversity and inclusion. Um, so somebody said the small amount of work that gets done feels like it's ticking boxes, but there's no drive from senior leadership. Somebody else is saying staff are trying to bring about discussion and change with a manager and they're being met with lack of interest or understanding. So Sharon, any thoughts on if you're in an organization with perhaps um, less infrastructure, just being a bit smaller? So, uh, of course, where you have larger organizations that have dedicated heads of or dedicated leads on DNI, then there is, uh, there is someone who uh, is sort of the, the lighthouse, as it were, for guiding the agenda. It is more challenging in smaller organizations, in a sense, but also they, because of their size, they've got greater agility. Uh, they are able to be more responsive compared with larger organizations. So if, if this conversation is, if the, the source of this question is from someone who is ground up in the conversation, um, then you are, your, your, your proximity to decision makers is closer. And I would urge you to say, look, um, here bring, I'm a, a, a barrister by profession and so Bringing the evidence is always the compelling piece for me. So bring the evidence and bring the persuasive argument as to why this needs to be front and center for this organization. Reminding, informing, raising awareness of what the, the, the next generation of employees will be expecting. I think there's some really interesting research on what millennials are looking for in their organizations, what they're expecting as a minimum, what they want to see on websites. And I feel the more we, we build up our knowledge base, those who are advocates and the cheerleaders and the champions, build up your knowledge base, 
get support from other organizations, find other cheerleaders, share information, and then continue to bring the argument as to why this is important to your um, direct line up, share why it's important and bring the connection as close as you can, bring in proximity as far as raising awareness is concerned because your lines of communication are actually tighter than in your corporate sort of oil, oil rigs. Oil rigs don't change. Those things, those ship liners, they <laughs> move. The, those that, that, that move. Okay, thank you. Um, Jeffrey, um, a question here on any advice on supporting kind of the sustainability of this agenda? Um, because it was the best will in the world, holding up the EDI agenda over a period of time can be challenging. Um, how do we continue to keep it front and centre? year on year and I'll just add a question of mine to that um when we're talking about kind of the anti-racism in particular which is kind of very very emotionally charged how do you keep yourselves from burning out um so how do you work on this agenda sustainably I think it's a, a bit of a well-being issue and so I think how do you keep this conversation front and center you I think I've said this before you align your objectives to the business so I think you know if the organization has a growth strategy you align the work that you're doing around diversity and inclusion to that growth strategy to so looking at how are you going to recruit people how are you going to promote and retain them what relationships do you need to build externally to attract that talent into the organization but also how do you maintain education for the employees that are already within the business so you know a few years ago we wouldn't have been having that many conversations about our trans colleagues however now we sit very much fundamentally in the conversation of what it means to have a trans identity and how that shows up at work so i think you know, this conversation is something that's an evolution that continues to evolve. And I think if you're doing a DNI role, it's about you being able to bring that to the forefront, but also to kind of do it in a way that's building empathy, that's building EQ, that's building uh, a, a collection of people that now understand how they can shape and own this. I think around managing your well-being and your health around talking about anti-racism, I think it's creating those moments to have those moments to stop. So you know, I think, again, speaking to my friends and colleagues that work in this space, especially during the last few months, it's been hard because they haven't had that space to be able to really step back, especially when they're doing global roles, because they were switching on to speak to those in America, to speak to those here in the UK and, and in other parts of Europe. And I think it's been able to say, actually, on the weekend, I'm actually not going to do anything. I'm going to spend time with family and friends. I'm going to watch a film. I'm going to read a book. I'm actually going to do something that brings me joy. Uh, I don't want to be like Mary Kondo, but it's that moment of, you know, literally finding those bits of joy and, and, and leaning into that and saying, do you know something? It's okay to not worry about this today. And I think because everyone's kind of saying we want solutions now, we want to change now. And if we're all being honest with ourselves, this is a conversation that's been going on for a number of years. You know, my parents were born here, uh, you know, of Caribbean immigrants, and they were having this conversation within their, their career time. So this is not something that we're going to solve tomorrow. This is something that we're going to be gradually moving towards and making sure that, you know, you understand that as an individual working in this space is definitely an imperative. Thank you. And Sharon, you want to come in on the wellbeing, please? Yeah, so I think it's really important as well to um, not be overtaxed on this. So yes, it may well be the case that we, are, we start out as the premier crusading voice in our organization. But if you are finding that over a period of time, you are being stonewalled and ignored, and no one is taking on board what you're saying, there is no movement, there is no shift, there is no appetite and you are facing burnout as you continue to perpetually knock on a door that will not be opened, then there has to be a choice that has to be made. And actually feeling that you are the savior for that organization can in fact wear and tear at your mental health. So I feel it's really important for us to weigh in the balance one wanting to drive change and that's important it's to to i feel that when we have that on our heart that that's a call for us to do something but that has to be weighed against knowing or sensing when this resistance will not relent and if this resistance remains in place and you continue to be knocking your head against a brick wall then your mental health can become um challenged and taxed and I feel that sometimes it's just about knowing when to walk away. That's a really great point and something that came up a lot in our 
previous sessions as well. Yeah. Um, and the question that, um, that I had on my original list that came up a few times in previous sessions that we, we had was, if you are a more junior member of staff, do you have any, and, a, and specifically a, a kind of people professional or an HR professional, um, Lorraine, do you have any advice on influencing upwards? Um, I think identify those people that you may have heard that have made noises that are positive and, and, and align with your thinking and, and build that allyship from the, from the bottom up. So if you've heard others in your organisation, which I'm, I'm crossing my fingers, you're not a lone ranger, then I think align yourself with them, have a conversation with them and work out how between you, you can get that person to begin to articulate some of the, ch the challenges and some of the solutions or better still give yourself an opportunity uh, an, an inroad into to, to articulating them yourself i think an element of, of boldness and, and and bravery is required as in stepping up and, and stepping in um, and and try not to be afraid of the hierarchy but more that you are adding value to the business by helping the business recognize the need for for change um, and and that will help to cr create a, a a positive environment and I don't say that lightly I know I know it is challenging and I, I know that it is it is not straightforward but if we don't do it actually then 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 we're, we're sort of complicit in in the problem thank you uh, I've got about 10 minutes left and I'm going to try and get through as many questions as possible but there are a lot um Peter any thoughts on on I think this is an interesting point in the terms of the criticality of leaders in this space do you think public statements and declarations are helpful or do more damage that's very timely, I think, if we look back a few months ago at uh, what was happening on, on social media. Yeah. Uh, of course, public statements are helpful if you backed it up with some reality and context and real action. I think where people rightly have got very concerned about public statements is where they're not coming from a place which seems to understand where you really are as an organisation, what action you're taking. So this idea of what's become known as virtue signaling. I just want to be out there with public statements showing in some way or some, some shape or form I support these agendas. But as I say, without the backing and substance behind it. And that's what I really understand people got very, very frustrated on in the early days, of, uh, particularly when you know, the, the, the George Floyd killing accelerated this debate so much. So we have to be really, really careful. I mean, I do want, and I strongly believe for a long time, that businesses must be more transparent. They must be more transparent about where they are and all these issues of inclusion, what metrics which we've already discussed they're using, and talk about openly what they are doing to change it. What's their narrative? So I very, very strongly believe in that. But as I said, we can't, we, we have to guard against just throwing you know bland statements out there, which after all, people have got very, very fed up with for a long time. And I think so much the anger that came out following the death of George Floyd was because they'd heard these things before. Yet we hadn't seen action and real change. So I think again, it's a stark reminder that if we're going to put statements out there, we better be able to back them up, and we better be able to show what we're doing. But as I said, with all of that said, I I really do believe and strongly encourage more and more transparency on these issues. So after all, we can all be held to account. It's not just what we do internally to hold ourselves to account, it's what everybody else is doing. Whether we're a private sector company and all this so-called ESG, environmental, social, and governance questions, being asked more and more by investor communities, our reputation, which we talked about before, and therefore all stakeholders uh, engaging in those conversations with us. And, and if we really want to keep the stuff on the agenda, as we've been saying for leaders, then more transparency so all stakeholders can see what we're doing and encouraging us to keep it on the agenda, I think is a big part of this debate as well. And very quickly, somebody's just asked, um, could you share any of the tangible actions that CIPD is taking internally? Yeah, no, absolutely. So first of all, yeah, but we, we did take our time to be clear on the statements we're making that we could back them up, what we were doing internally as well as externally. So the internal things, and this is a very important point, of course, we're looking at some of the HR things we're doing. We're bringing in others so they can have an objective view and give people an objective voice about what their lived experience is. Uh, working within the CIPD and looking at all our HR pra practices and policies. So we're obviously doing that, but we're doing more than that because we recognize inclusion in this way is more than just what you do with your people. It's about all the things that you represent, in particular for an organization like us, all of the events that we run, that we know that we can be sure that we are sending the right signals with the people on our platform, with the content that we're producing, with how we work with our suppliers and partners. And all those things are coming together. And overall, what we see is a 
a really significant shift for us as an organization in seeing this much more strategically and not, as I said, therefore, just an HR issue, no matter how in central that is, it's actually an organization wide issue. And, and we will publish all the things that we're doing. And so we made very open commitments about this and talking about it very openly. But I really stress this, it's more than just what we do through HR. It's how we turn up, how we show up, how we represent our organizations, how we partner, how we communicate, how we share learning content and everything else. Thank you. Um, we've got a few questions about creating safe spaces and somebody's asked about kind of assuming positive intent. So people might be expressing themselves a bit clumsily. Um, but is there a role for assuming positive intent in these kind of discussions? Um, Jeffrey, can I ask that of you? Yeah, sure. Um, so positive, of course, assume positive intent. Assume that, you know, you've gone to work in these organisations where people are open to learning. And I think for me, I've always found when someone said something that I've found either discriminatory or felt that they needed to learn something, I've given them the story. I've explained to them why. So I don't know if whoever follows me on LinkedIn, you might have seen I had a conversation with a colleague of mine who told me that he didn't see colour. And so I basically sat him down and I said to him, do you know something? Do you know how detrimental that statement is in the effect of not seeing my the whole of my identity? So it's okay for you to call me a black man or for you to say, Jeffrey's the black man that sits over there on the right-hand side of the floor. That's perfectly fine because that's who I am. What you don't, what you're not allowed to do is X, Y, and Z. And I think those moments of actually quantifying and explaining to people the parts of language they can use or should use and the parts of language that might get them into trouble, it's those moments where you're going to build that allyship. I think it's also at the moment people are talking about all the books that people, different people should read. I think, you know, for me, I'm creating opportunities for my network to then come and speak to me about those books and for us to have a dialogue of what did they learn, what did they find uncomfortable. So I think allyship is the only way that we will see that shift. I think Sharon said earlier on when we were talking about Nelson Mandela and the fact that people protesting were all, of all different shades and colours, I think that is how this world will move forward. If you think about the, the conversation of LGBT equality, that has been fought by everybody and that's why we're seeing the advancements. So when we speak about race, I think it is that we do need to make sure that we have those allies. And I think it's also that piece of thinking about the relationships that you do have outside of your organization so a lot of the time you know someone everyone knows a woman most people know someone that might identify as lgbt or living with a disability not everybody has a close personal relationship with someone of color and i think that then hinders how we have the conversations within our organizations so i think it's also thinking about how do you build those authentic and connected partnerships with people that you don't work with to them understand the people that you do work with Thank you. And you gave a really lovely example there. It's a question that somebody did ask about, can anybody share any of the actual language they use when being bridge builders with defensive or cynical people and kind of sharing any of your lived experience? So you gave a really lovely example there, Jeffrey. Um, Lorraine, have you got any examples you could quickly share? Um, so I, I start from a place of positive intent and then, uh, then I was reflecting on the question from Frank Devine, which I think is, is really important. Because uh, sometimes, and otherwise, you know, we wouldn't have been here, we wouldn't be having this conversation perennially. Um, sometimes the positive intent is not enough. So there's a required action that, 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 that people with the positive intent need to manifest in order for us to make that progress. So I, I think you, in my experience, I'm, I'm incredibly open to different opinions, different ways of being, and I like a good robust exchange. And I think that that's really important and I'm, and I'm open to that, but that's not for everybody. Um, for some people, they want to find somebody else who can work in, in a slightly different way. And that is diversity. So I think it's locking into the kind of mechanisms that help you to help the changes that we need to see. And, and, and some of it will be discomforting, just as I might find some opinions discomforting. So the conversation about not seeing color, I might handle slightly differently to Jeffrey. So, you know, it, it's, it's, that's how we are. And I think we just need to be, and I don't mean just in, in a reductive sense, we need to be much more positively curious about each other, but also willing to have an exchange so that we are open to learning. And I think that that's what we're frightened of. You know, British people are frightened of saying black for a whole host of, of reasons. Find it difficult to describe black people. Um, why is that? We've, we've already given you permission to use the word and yet still we're having the conversation. So 
some of our exasperation, Frank and, and others, is based on the fact that we have always had the positive intent and, and accepted that you wanted to do things differently and better. But actually, sometimes that's wearing because we're not seeing the progress at the pace and to the degree that one would have hoped hundreds and hundreds of years hence. So, so let's have the conversation. Let's not give up. Let's be resilient. Let's be bold, lean in, step in, do all of those things and know that it is an iterative process of, of change that we're embarked upon. Thank you. Um, and I'm just going to ask Sharon for any closing thoughts from you, Sharon. Well, I mean, uh, what I celebrate is the fact that there are so many people on this call. And if, as we continue to have these conversations and drive the agenda, we will see change. And it's so important that we hold hope in these situations, because if we enter in to the uh, perennial cynicism, that's the way in which we'll approach the world. And I, I remember, I'm, I'm a mum of three, raising three children, three black uh, youngsters in the UK. And I remind them of a, a quote that I came across um, by Albert Einstein. And he said, is this world a friendly place? The response to that question is how we will walk on the earth. Mm -hmm. And I really believe that, that actually, I believe that most people have good intention. Most people want the world to be a better place for everyone. And if we align ourselves and we aid and facilitate relationships with those people, then we'll start to see the change that we want to see. Thank you. I'm afraid that's all we've got time for this afternoon. Uh, I'm sorry that I didn't get to all the questions. I can see some people are a bit annoyed that I didn't get to the questions that we did have um, quite a lot of them. Uh, so I did get through as many as could and feel free to send them directly to us at the, at the CIBD if it's something that you'd like to see us addressed. Um, thank you so much to our absolutely fantastic panel. Um, really brilliant, thought-provoking contributions from absolutely everybody. Thank you to the audience. Um, thanks for being engaged on the chat and on the Q&A. Uh, this is the first in a series of free webinars on the topic of keeping anti-racism on the agenda. Next Monday at the same time, we're going to be looking at ethnicity pay gap reporting and other policy leaders, and we'll be going to be joined by Ruby McGregor-Smith. And the Monday after that, we're going to be exploring the role of employee networks. So please do join us for both of those. This webinar is going to be available on demand from this afternoon, if you want to watch it again or share it with any of your colleagues. Uh, but that is it from us. Thank you so much for watching, and uh, I hope you'll have a really good afternoon. Bye for now.